I think there's something sort of powerful and appealing about the sort of the secret life of toys idea, the idea that inanimate objects, you know, may come to life when human beings aren't looking. I think that's always been a sort of an interesting idea and something that was intriguing, you know, to me as a child. So that was established very well in the first movie. And then the challenge and sort of the opportunity was to take that idea, take what had been established so well in the first film and then try and push it further, push it into a different genre, a different kind of story for this, this sequel. Well, we definitely wanted to, to make this a more complicated emotional story for Romeo and Juliet. In fact, when I first met uh, you know, James McAvoy and Emily Blunt and introduced myself as the, you know, the new director, I asked them both what they'd like to do in the, in, in the second film. And they both said that they'd like to dig a bit deeper into their characters, to have them be a bit more emotionally complicated, to be, even be a bit flawed. Um, uh, and so we sort of tried to, you know, construct a story that would allow that to happen. Uh, and this, this, if the first film was sort of girl meets boy, then I think this film is how does girl and boy stay together? It's about respect and relationships, and that's sort of really the theme of the film. And it's a theme that sort of played out in the parallel stories of the relationship of Romeo and Juliet and uh, Sherlock and Dr. Watson. This is a much bigger movie in terms of its uh, visual scope than the first film. The first film was sort of basically set in a couple of gardens and sort of a, a, a street and a park. Um, and, and this film is, you know, takes place all across London. So it's got a, it's a much bigger backdrop to tell the story against. Um, and the first, you know, the first film was sort of a, a musical romantic comedy. And this film is much more a sort of a comedy adventure. Well, when we first pitched the, the idea to Paramount, we pitched it as a Sherlock Holmes story, uh, 12 inches tall. And uh, I love Sherlock Holmes, you know, uh, I love those stories when I was a child growing up. Sherlock and Tarzan were my two favorite literary characters. So we wanted to, you know, be respectful as much as we could. Um, of uh, you know the the canon and, and Sherlock Holmes, we didn't want to make a parody. We didn't want to, you know, be too far away from uh, 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 the original source. Um, but we did want to have fun with you know the scale and uh, the idea of you know uh, pieces of pottery, uh, you know, out in a very hostile environment, you know, London. Irene Adler is you know an extremely powerful figure from the Sherlock uh, Holmes canon, although she, you know, she, she's only really in, in one main story in reference and a couple of others, and yet she has a huge uh, influence because she is the woman to Sherlock. You know, she's the only woman that Sherlock seems to have had any great respect for, and that has been interpreted in other stories as possibly being a romance or you know, partnership or who knows. So we have our own uh, version of that uh, uh, in in our film, uh, Irene in our film is a is a absolutely beautiful uh, wooden doll, hand carved. We think she's the sort of like uh, uh, almost an art object, a one off, and she's we we meet her as the sort of slightly enigmatic boss of uh, uh, in a doll museum full of kind of weird, creepy Victorian dolls, where she's sort of seems to be somewhat like an underworld boss, but also seems to have had some prior relationship with Sherlock that didn't seem to go too well. And Irene in our story is played by Mary J. Blige. And we have Chiwetel Ejiofor playing Watson, and we definitely didn't want a Nigel Bruce Watson from the Basil Rathbone film, sort of the, uh, the slightly bumbling old duffer. We wanted, you know, a Watson that was much more um, true to, you know, Conan Doyle, even though we sort of adopted um, a slightly Nigel Bruce design. He's sort of quite short and portly because uh, we figured that the gnome factory who'd made, you know, Sherlock Gnomes and Dr. Watson would make the cliche, so they would make, you know, Sherlock gnomes look like the cliched version of Sherlock with the deer stalker in the Inverness 
cape and that Watson would probably come out looking a bit Nigel Bruce. But he doesn't behave like Nigel Bruce. He's very sharp, uh, almost uh, Sherlock's equal, um, very athletic despite his physique, very brave and courageous. You know, he's, you know, he's much, uh, you know, he's much truer, I think, to the, to the book in his, in his personality and character than he appears visually. The process of developing any character is, is, you know, begins with drawings, you know, just starting with sketches and, you know, based around an idea and then the drawings often take on a life of their own and that may lead you down a, a certain route and you may abandon some of the, the earlier things because you see a drawing that, that sort of gives you um, some inspiration. Why was it important to take Romeo and Juliet? out of their gardens for this movie. Well, Nomi and Juliet spend actually quite a lot of time separated in this film. Um, and that's one of the things we wanted to do in the film was to, to really test them, you know, physically and psychologically. So we, we, we took them away from everything that they, they know. We took them away from their relationship. We took them away from their family. We took them out of their gardens or out of any garden, which is sort of, you know, a, a gnome's comfort zone, you know, sort of soft grass and sort of, you know, soft earth and things, you know, and we put them in this very hostile environment of a big, you know, urban city like London full of dangerous hard surfaces and they're country gnomes in the big city that don't know how the big city works. So we really wanted to, to make life as challenging and difficult for them as possible so that they could both really, you know, be tested and uh, earn their reconciliation at the end of the movie. The first film has quite a limited set of locations, you know, which is entirely, you know, appropriate to the story it was telling. Two, two gardens in conflict, you know, the sort of the street behind uh, those gardens and, and, a, and a park. Um, you know, our film, as I said, is, is designed to be a big adventure that ranges all across London. So that means we have many more locations. Our locations are, you know, much bigger and much more complicated. Um, uh, and, and so it was a much more challenging thing to do, to have a lot of environments and a lot of, you know, very difficult and complicated environments. You know. I, I think the role of the director is... Uh, is to sort of supply a, a, an overall vision for the film and try and inspire everybody on the film uh, who's working on the film um, with that vision and to get everybody pointed in the same direct direction. Um, and then, uh, you know, basically to leave them hell alone when they know what they're doing and to sort of step in and gently course correct if um, you think, uh, think the film is not following, you know, the path that it should. Um, and to try and make as many good decisions as often as possible. You know, in a live action film, you shoot a lot of coverage and we can't afford to do that in an animated film. It's too expensive. So we do all our coverage basically in, and try and get our mistakes out of the way in story uh, where we're just you know, throwing away black and white sketches. But those simple black and white sketches that we create in story department can tell you whether an idea is working um, or, or whether you should abandon it. Uh, and if it works slightly, even slightly, in a simple black and white sketch, if you can get a laugh or even an emotional reaction um, from looking at a series of black and white drawings, you know, sort of projected like a filmed comic strip, that, that is a very useful and fairly inexpensive tool to tell you whether your film is sort of on the right track or not before you go into the very complicated and expensive process of actually you know, moving it into three-dimensional computer graphics. I'm incredibly blessed and lucky because we have an amazing cast for this film. You know, all the, the, the cast from the first movie, you know, Emily Blunt, James McAvoy, Michael Caine, Maggie Smith, Stephen Merchant, Matt Lucas, Ashley Jensen, Oswald Osborne. Uh, they're all returning for this film. Plus, we've added Johnny Depp as Sherlock and Chiwetel Ejiofor as Dr. Watson. Mary J. Blige is uh, Irene Adler. And uh, Jamie Dimitri, who is our villain, Moriarty. And, um, uh, you know, 
they're all absolutely extraordinary and they make my life very easy because when you work with people who are that talented, um, you know, it's just a gift. It's important to remember that our main character is Sherlock Gnomes. It's not Sherlock Holmes. He's a pottery interpretation of Sherlock Holmes. So he's allowed to be a little, you know, we take a, we take a few more liberties with, with Sherlock than if we were doing a canonical Sherlock Holmes story. At the heart, we wanted to be as true to Conan Doyle Sherlock as, as we could be, you know, that Sherlock always fights on the side of the angels, that, you know, even though he might might be annoying and eccentric and and sometimes appear to be lacking in empathy or, you know, focused on his work above all things, you know, when, when push comes to shove, Sherlock will put himself in harm's way to, you know, so that, so that good will prevail. And that was sort of a, a key thing when I was talking to Johnny that we would have in Sherlock, that however eccentric and however, you know, funny, you know, Sherlock, you know, might be on occasion, you know, at his heart he is a protector and, uh, and a noble character that will, you know, sort of risk everything to, to make sure that, uh, you know, that uh, good wins and evil is defeated. One of the first things that I sort of challenged myself with and challenged the crew with was like, you know, what if this film was being shot by an, a 12-inch gnome camera crew and we, we just equipped them with, with like scaled uh, camera equipment, you know, anything they, they like, you know, they got, they got great cameras and they've got, you know, great sort of rigs and cranes and booms and everything, but it's all scaled. How would... You know what would those camera moves be like? How would that, how would that, look? You know, if if, if our characters who are small were close to camera, then what happens to the world behind? And so, you know, depth of field became a sort of a, an important storytelling tool for us. That we all movie making is a collaboration, and making an animated movie is probably the highest degree of collaboration you know, possible. Because every single thing that you see has to be designed. Nothing is free. <clears throat> so you have to work with, you know, many, many very talented people to, to get anything up on the screen. And that's the fun, you know. Uh, and a lot of it's, you know, a lot of it is very hard work that goes on for a long time. You spend years and years of your life making one of these things. But the, you know, the highlight is always... If you've, if you've worked with a crew of people that you really like and admire. Music is, you know, it's a very big and important part of the film as it was in the, in the first film. It's a very key um, element because we have, you know, Elton John and, and uh, Bernie Taupin um, from, you know, who are sort of writing new songs as they did for the, for the first film. Also, we're reusing... Uh, sort of classic uh, Elton John songs, but we're um, we're sort of reimagining them in a in a new way. We're having Penal sort of remix classic Elton, and then we're taking sort of uh, musical motifs from from Elton John's um, you know work, and we're interleaving that in the um, the actual score for the film. So there'll be phrases from Elton John songs that will appear in the uh, orchestral score.